think somebody might need to mute themselves. I do hear some background noise. Um, but I think we should go ahead and get started. So let me just go ahead and say, welcome everyone. Mahara Bikam, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for some of you all. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you here today. My name is Robin Al Haddad. I'm a research associate at Tango International and I'm based in uh, Tucson, Arizona. I am the community manager for QualMe, that's IDEAL's qualitative monitoring and evaluation peer community. And I'm happy to welcome you all here today. This is our fourth quarterly QualMe event and it's an info session on best practices for mixed methods, data analysis, presentation and application. Um, this is a peer community, so we want to encourage you all to talk to each other. Uh, we'd like to get to know each other a bit better, and so we'd like you to please introduce yourself in the chat box if you haven't already done that. Um, share your name, your organization, the position where you are based, and um, you can put all those responses into the chat. Um, before we get started, we also want to inform everyone that we will have will providing um, Arabic interpretation during today's meeting. So please um, click on the interpretation globe at the bottom of your screen and select your preferred language. Um, unfortunately, the interpretation feature does not work um, if you're connected to your phone and it also is not working in the breakout rooms. Um, but if you do need assistance in the breakout rooms and you'd like to be um, in a breakout room with the Arabic interpreter, um, please let us know and we will try to help you out with that. Um, also, just a, a reminder of a few basic house rules. Um, if you could please mute your microphone when you're not speaking so that we don't hear background noises. Um, you can use the chat box or the raise your hand button if you'd like to ask a question and we will try and call on you. We will try to get um, our you know, we will try to answer as many questions as we can during the, the short time that we have here today. Um, if your bandwidth allows, please turn on your video when you're speaking so that we can get to know each other a bit better and, and see other members of the community. Um, we are recording today's session, so um, you will get a link at, of the recording after the event. And then um, uh, just a little bit about QualMe, what we are. Uh, we generally held meetings about once a quarter and each meeting has a different topic of discussion. This happens to be our fourth meeting. We've had previous events that you can um, check out online if you'd like to see the videos on YouTube, they're, they're available for the earlier events. But today's meeting is focusing on best practices for mixed method data analysis, presentation and application. Um, and it's really intended to just give a very brief overview of best practices for mixed method analysis and presentation. Um, today, we're gonna to hear from some colleagues that are from the Institute of Development Impact, or I4DI, LabCorp, and Save the Children. And then after our plenary discussion, we will break out into small individual discussions, small breakout groups. Um, we are a community here and we really want to um, create a safe space for people to communicate with each other. It doesn't matter really if you are doing qualitative research for the last 20 years or you're really new to the field. Uh, we really want to hear from everyone. Um, so we're encouraging all, you all to really share your experiences when you do go into those breakout rooms. Um, but first, before we get started with our first speaker, we'd like to do a quick chat store. So traditionally, data interpretation and results for quantitative and qualitative analysis are discussed usually separately. So our question is, what are some best practices for integrating qualitative and quantitative data together and to draw out new insights and tell a cohesive story? So you can put your respond to that question into the chat, please. What are some best practices for integrating qualitative and quantitative together to draw out a new insights and tell a cohesive story? So let's see what if we have um, some responses. I'll give it a minute for people to 
put their responses in the chat. Case studies using surveys. Delphi study. Community studies. So how do we integrate qualitative and quantitative data together? Start with quantitative and use qualitative for follow-up on emerging issues. Consider how to integrate qual and quant from the very beginning. That's great, Karen. <laughs> Exactly, it needs to be part of the design process. Use the data from quantitative analysis to inform qualitative inquiry. And this helps interpretation of data, learn reasons behind quantitative numbers. That's right. All right, well, Let's now see how our first guest has addressed some of this, this issue in his work. So we're now going to turn it over to our first presenter to share his experiences. Uh, first, I would like to introduce Micah Frumkin from the Institute for Development Impact, or I4DI. Uh, we will hear from Micah on, on how I4ID, I4DI explores complex data sets and interactive visual data analysis tools such as their real dashboard, uh, which provides a synthesis of results into an accessible and practical format for all audiences. Micah is the senior MEL director at I4DI, where he oversees the implementation of monitoring, evaluation, and learning, or MEL activities for a diverse set of public and private sector clients and drives innovation and thought leadership for the organization as it leverages digital solutions to develop development challenges. Micah brings about 15 years of MEL experience and has helped to train more than 500 United States government staff and partners in designing and conducting evaluations and has authored several prominent mixed method studies throughout his career. So now I'm gonna hand it over to you, Micah. Thank you so much, Robin, for that great introduction. Um, very glad to be here today on a really important topic that I think about frequently. So really glad to be part of um, Qualme today and, and this um, conversation that we'll be having. I'm going to talk about some mixed methods analyses that I4DI has recently conducted, um, specifically an evidence synthesis exercise that we did under a real program for USAID. I'll spend a little bit of time introducing that program and our synthesis work, explain why we used a mixed methods approach, as well as some of the challenges and successes that we experienced. I'll wrap up providing a few lessons learned and some tips to consider for your future mixed methods research efforts. Next slide, please. So the REAL activity stands for Resilience, Evaluation, Analysis, and Learning. And it's designed to identify, synthesize, adapt, and share the highest quality information and tools to build capacity and establish best practices among USAID missions, implementing partners, host country governments that work together in resilience programming. That consortium is led by Save the Children, but also includes Food for the Hungry, Mercy Corps, Tango International, and blends a mix of expertise in resilience program implementation, monitoring and evaluation, social and behavior change, and knowledge management. Throughout its implementation, REAL has worked closely with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security to leverage and build on rapidly expanding knowledge in the areas of resilience evidence generation, thought leadership and resilience measurement and analysis, and application of knowledge for adaptive management and resilience programs. The real synthesis, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, the real synthesis that we conducted um, started in late 2021. I4DI was brought in to help design and then conduct a synthesis of evidence coming from seven distinct USAID resilience programs 
that took place between 2013 and 2020. Those programs spread across Africa and reached as far as Nepal, and really were all focused on different aspects of resilience. The purpose of the synthesis was to identify key findings across program documents and resources and data in order to promote cross-cutting learning and better informed resilience practices. This screen shows some of the programs that were looked at for this evidence synthesis. So why did we use a mixed methods analysis? I4DI worked closely with real counterparts to identify and gather sources of evidence for the synthesis. They ranged from traditional annual and final reports, periodic reports, to evaluations and case studies, and they included associated quantitative data sets, such as performance monitoring data sets or data sets coming from uh, evaluations, impact evaluations. It was quickly apparent, based on the breadth and types of sources available, that we would need to use a mixed methods approach, which would allow us to fully analyze, triangulate, corroborate, and interpret both quantitative and qualitative data across data sources and across formats. Some of the methods that we used include systematic reviews of the reports, report summaries, executive summaries, and whatnot, and then using qualitative data analysis software to conduct content and pattern analysis. These led to identifying broad themes and then subsequently a larger number of subdomains and headline statements, which allowed us to really understand the nuances within those themes, where we were seeing patterns in the data, trends and, and whatnot. Other data were analyzed using quantitative data analysis software to identify trends in the data, seeing what was happening over time, looking at baseline data versus endline data. We also looked at the relationships both within and across the various data sets. Wherever possible, we cross-analyze the data to validate and corroborate findings, trying to prevent unsubstantiated conclusions, really making sure that we understood what each data set, each piece of data were really telling us looking at how the story coming from qualitative aspects of reports uh, corresponded to the quantitative data underlying a lot of those reports. As is all too often, the synthesis didn't necessarily go exactly as designed, and we ran to a few data analysis challenges, primarily around comparability and compatibility of data. For example, the data, the evidence synthesis wasn't really considered until late in implementation. This meant that information in the reports wasn't necessarily structured in a manner that facilitates this kind of exercise. It forced our team to be creative in how we extracted common themes and topics. Each study was also highly context specific and designed for specific purposes determined by distinct clients or USAID counterparts. At the same time, the field of resilience measurement advanced significantly over time. This was a study from 2013 to 2020. There was a lot happening. Resilience was a very big topic at the time. This led to evolutions in methodological practices, ultimately meaning that the methods applied in each study were similar, but not exactly the same. Data collection instruments, variables, performance indicators, often had nuanced aspects that prevented direct comparison or broad conclusions. Another challenge, and one we consistently struggle with, is finding appropriate ways to simultaneously visualize quantitative and qualitative data in a manner that is easily processed by the user and enables telling a comprehensive and rich story. I'm glad to say we had some great successes. We were able to complete the synthesis with very positive feedback. Uh, sorry, uh, with very positive feedback from stakeholders, um, from USAID, from REAL. We accomplished that by maintaining, maintaining a very transparent and collaborative process throughout the synthesis, repeatedly engaging counterparts and stakeholders to validate findings, ensure we are proceeding along the right analytical path, and eliciting buy-in to the results. This helped us refine our processes and continue to learn throughout the process. This became increasingly important as we began to package and present our findings. But I think the most significant success came through the decision to create an 
interactive dynamic web-based presentation of results through a dashboard instead of a traditional PDF report. This dashboard enabled stakeholders to engage directly with the data themselves, looking at the evidence and drawing their own conclusions. The interactivity also encouraged longer participation with the data, allowing it to really settle in and provide each user with the unique experience. A more traditional report would have forced our team to draw fewer and more concrete conclusions, giving space and presentation limitations, ultimately undermining the quality of the information presented and what would be received by the end user. For those of you planning to conduct similar studies in the future, I wanna share just a few lessons learned and some tips to consider as you move into the design. Whenever possible, and often it may not be feasible, try to establish a research or learning agenda prior to program design. The more forethought that can be put into the end products and their use, the more likely the programs can be designed to facilitate quality evidence syntheses or other forms of mixed methods research. If feasible, try to maintain consistent methodological guidance and approaches which can facilitate mixed methods research at the end of the day. This may be challenging, particularly as current development conversations are moving towards adaptive management and research for development decision-making, which means that we really need to have specific research for specific decisions, often undermining the ability to have long-term consistency or really maintain a rigid structure for research. I'd also note that even when you do have consistent guidance in place or you have consistent methodolo methodological approaches, across contexts or programs, comparability of data may not always fall into place, though it can certainly help increase the likelihood that it will. For specific research efforts, such as a synthesis, be sure to establish clear purpose, scope, and boundaries early on. It helps maintain focus and can prevent overwhelming researchers or stakeholders with too much information. When you're not extremely clear at the beginning about what exactly you're trying to do or what some themes might be, you end up having a kitchen sink scenario where everything might be considered and it can slow down the process to getting to the ultimate end goal of finding very tacit findings and results. Lastly, for qualitative data, consider visualizations that draw on data patterns or groupings or finding ways to quantify qualitative data to make it more visualized, to, to allow it to be uh, presented in a more structured manner. Well, I encourage everybody to visit the real evidence synthesis dashboard, and we can provide a link to that. Uh, I wanted to share a few static images of several data visualizations embedded within that dashboard. These highlight a variety of ways that we presented qualitative and quantitative findings side by side. It draws me back to the original question that we asked before I started about how do you think about qualitative and quantitative simultaneously? And I think our response would say an interactive dashboard, somewhere where you can see qualitative results and quantitative results at the same time. They may not be in the exact same visual, but having multiple visuals, a suite of interactive elements, which can help you draw your own conclusions on what was said qualitatively and quantitatively. I'd like to stop now and open up to any questions that people might have. Yes, thank you so much, Micah, for that awesome presentation um, on showing how um, I4DI has really done a great amount of work to synthesize a lot of non-comparable qualitative and quantitative data from many different sources. And um, you all, it sounds like you've given a lot of consideration on how to best present the data to show a cohesive story. So does anybody have questions for Micah? Feel free to either raise your hand, push the raise your hand button, or you can just write your question into the chat and we will um, try to answer. I'll give it a minute, see if anybody has any questions. Hello, sorry I joined late, but just to ask um, about uh, the uh, the best uh, presentation in terms of infographics. What would best present, and if there are any, you know, recommended uh, analytical uh, tools that I would uh, recommend. 
uh, to best uh, bring out the two. I know there are qualitative analytics like SPSS data, I mean, it's quantitative like SPSS data. And then there is the qualitative like in vivo and then uh, Atlas TI. But then now the, it, it comes now to the point of uh, the dashboard presentation in terms of the infographics. So some, if you could throw more lights on that, thanks. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, we did use um, a, a variety of, of, of methods. Um, we did use some qualitative software, as I mentioned, and quantitative software. But when it gets to the visualization of data, I think it really depends on what those data look like um, and really letting the, the data come out in the most natural visual possible. There are great um, very accessible data visualization options out there, something like a Tableau. We have in-house um, data scientists and web coders, and so we use them to help create our visuals internally. Um, but there are a number of great options. I, When I think about how to answer your question, I think about um, an analogy to a woodcarver who says they see a block of wood and they see a spoon in the block of wood and they carve until the spoon comes out. And I think it's really seeing your data and then finding the story it's trying to tell and the most appropriate visual. Um, we, when designing visuals, try to make them interactive um, as opposed to static visuals. So it's very, it's easy in Excel to come up with a graph or a chart, but that only tells limited data. And so if you can try and find some data where maybe there's a, a slide and it shows how data evolve over time or different buttons or tabs that allow you to see how data may behave differently in different contexts, geographically or sectorally, um, trying to really leverage those tools can elevate the story that the data tell. Hey, thank you. I think we have a question from Keelan. Um, so it looks like their hand may be raised. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Micah, for the, for the presentation. Can you talk a little bit uh, in terms of the how? Um, at times we, we see the, uh, you know, the, the, the dashboard is on the very end, the visualization. But the mechanics in between, in terms of how are you, I, do, did you have an organizing framework for the, uh, for the analysis? What framework was that? Uh, you know, if you could provide a little bit more detail in terms of how you actually managed to do it, as well as whether you had uh, situations where you didn't have convergence of evidence, uh, like qualitative uh, is saying something else, quantitative is saying something else, how did you address the lack of convergence of evidence uh, to end up you know, coming up with a, a dashboard that appears more smooth when you look at it? But I think the mechanics are what, you know, what, what I didn't quite get. Thank you. Sure, yeah. I think maybe that means that we were effective. I think that we tried to keep the dirty laundry behind the curtain so that not everyone can see kind of some of the bigger challenges. We wanted to highlight the results and we wanted to present it in a way where users could draw their conclusions on our data. But that doesn't necessarily present, as you mentioned, some of the um, lack of convergence. I think some of our bigger challenges and lack of convergence or rather where data were contradictory is rather not having them be complementary and really finding that data were saying different things as opposed to having them say um, opposite of the same thing, if, if I'm being clear there. And so I think that we, our initial framework was collaboratively designed. So we worked together with our counterparts at Real in order to come up with the themes and the sub themes and really build it up from there. So again, we let the data speak for itself. We didn't come in with an overly strong framework, but rather um, built that over time, tested it, validated it with our colleagues to make sure that we were understanding along the way. Um, and then letting those data come out. Part of the option to go with a, a, a dashboard that was highly dynamic and visual allowed us to present all of the data in manners that tell their own story and not trying to come to these bigger conclusions where we would have needed to reconcile those potential divergences. So I think it, it may be the nature of 
this, this particular evidence synthesis as opposed to other forms of mixed methods research, but I think it also was how we chose to present the data to avoid that challenge and make sure that we weren't saying anything that couldn't be substantiated. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it looks like we are actually running short on time, so I, I apologize. We are going to have to move on. Uh, it looks like you did get a, quite a few questions. Um, so maybe we, um, afterwards, if we have a minute, you can, you'll be able to answer some more, or in the breakout room, you can uh, follow up with people. But um, before we go on to our next presenter, we would like to do a quick poll, and we're going to try and create a word cloud. Um, our next presenter is going to show us a little bit about a data presentation. Um, so our question is, what are some examples of qualitative data visualization or data viz techniques that you have used in your work? So I want everyone to answer that question, but instead of answering it in the chat, as we did last time, um, we have posted a link to this AHA um, word cloud, and we are going to try and generate a word cloud so that we can all see it together. So what are some examples of qualitative, qualitative data visualization or data viz techniques that you've used in your work that could be making word clouds, infographics, Venn diagrams, call out boxes, using icons, illustrative maps. Um, let's, I'll give it a minute and see if people can respond to that. So please click on the link that you see in the chat and you can answer that question. All right, I see some people putting in some answers. It looks like quotes, that's a good one. Word clouds, seasonal calendars, uh, Venn diagrams, stories of change, that's a good one. Journey maps, that's a good one. Pull out quotes. Okay, well, let's go on. Well, let's see how our next partner has addressed some of these issues um, in her of data visualization in her work. Our next uh, presenter is Carrie Presnall. She's from LabCorp and will be presenting on qualitative data visualization techniques for report writing. 
Carrie is a senior associate at LabCorp Drug Development, and she has over 10 years of qualitative and mixed method research experience in academia, the private sector, and the international development fields, she, including seven years working with Tango International. She has focused on water and environmental policy, monitoring and evaluation of international humanitarian development activities. And she holds an MS from the University of Arizona and is a member of the Evergreen Data Visualization Academy. As Carrie is presenting, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box. She'll have an opportunity to answer questions immediately after her presentation. So now over to you, Carrie. All right, thanks, Robin. Um, uh, thanks for the intro. And I'll just mention that I, uh, I, I am working with LabCorp right now, but I'm not representing LabCorp in this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, why we should visualize um, qualitative data. I'm gonna give you some tools and guides um, and provide some examples um, <clears throat> from a variety of sources and leave you with a, a resource list because I can't talk about all the things, but I can give you some um, inspiration and some, um, some uh, other things to explore um, after this presentation. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so why use data visualization? You know, you get the, the reader's attention really quickly. Um, we all have a lot of competing information, long reports to read, and it's really nice to break up that text um, and give some, someone um, something to, to look at. First of all, our, our brains are, are programmed for uh, really uh, to take in visual information really quickly. Um, so that helps us to take in the information um, and also make it memorable. Um, so this um, page that I gave as an example um, features some gauge diagrams. So it gives you a real quick sense of, um, you know, something is better or worse, their colors makes, helps you look at it. And the, the, the text in this page is also, um, you know, formatted so that you can quickly um, read the, the, the bullets. Um, and a lot of the things that I, um, I'm going to, examples that I'm going to provide in this, um, the next few slides, I'm not going to talk about how to do it step by step, but there are references throughout. Um, and, and again, I'll leave you with the resource list. So there are more detailed instructions on how to make a lot of these things. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we mentioned, someone mentioned the, the, NV, the qualitative analysis software, and actually the first of the Kwame um, sessions talks about qualitative analysis and in vivo and LSTI, so you can check out that um, webinar, the recording online. Um, so I just wanted to say, you know, NVivo and Atlas TI, those are two software programs that you can use for qualitative analysis, and they do do um, uh, um, data visualization. They have some data viz tools in there, um, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't buy these. Um, these are paid for um, programs, uh, software programs. I would not invest in these just for the data visualization uh, tools that they have. Um, although the, the Sankey by Atlas TI is, is very colorful and beautiful, but there, there are other tools that you can use, and I'll talk about some other ways to visualize your data in the next slides. Um, so next slide. Um, so one that I love, this is this is this is just a starting point for how to decide what to use. I know that you cannot read everything that's on this um, chart and table. This is a qualitative um, chart chooser um, that uh, Stephanie Evergreen and um, Jennifer Lyon put together. Je Jennifer Lyons, excuse me, put together, and um, it helps you decide what kind of visualization to use. There's a long list that I put on the, the right, the word cloud, spectrum display, heat map, histogram, histomap, um, and on and on. Um, and, and it tells you uh, what, you know, if trying to figure out what kind of story you're trying to tell, it helps you decide um, which of these visualizations to use. Um, and if you go to the Stephanie Evergreen um, blog, I also put the, the link directly for this chart chooser, uh, you can get more information about, um, I think about all of these um, things that are listed here. Um, so that's a really great resource. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so I'm going to give you some examples. And actually, I'll just mention that these the icons that are here are um, free. What do you call them? Um, creative open they're, source. They're open source. Thank you. Open source icons that um, are on the noun project. Uh, have the link at the end, um, and they're these are icons by Ocha, so you can use them freely in your reports. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so highlighted text is uh, one of the things that you can use in reports. So I, I gathered examples to use that I would use in, in report writing. Um, so this um, example, um, the highlighting really makes you helps you look really quickly at what is the main idea and 100 Sonoran dogs <laughs> paid in $300 cash. So those are the main things that pop out really quickly. And for those of you, um, so this is a, an advertisement actually from a bank in Tucson and Tucson is semi-famous for Sonoran hot dogs. So that's what these little um, things are on the, the right-hand side. They're hot dogs that are uh, wrapped in bacon and topped with um, uh, beans and salsa and a little bit of sour cream. They're very delicious. And, you know, anybody who's in Tucson probably knows what they are. Um, so anyway, the, the in terms of the data viz, though, the highlighting really draws you in and, and, and makes you say like, oh, what a um, hundred snoring hot dogs. Uh, what I, I want to know more. So you can use the, this. This is a really easy data viz um, to use in report writing. Um, also helps if you have photos color, just a little pop, um, really draws you in. Um, so next slide, please. Um, quotes and photos is another easy thing to do. Um, this is um, uh, um, this is from the New York Times and they, this is from a, uh, well, they, what I like about this, Micah mentioned this, uh, a technique that you can use is to group your data. Um, so they put the quotes in columns by um, open or undecided. So these are opinions um, that uh, I think lawmakers or representatives have. So they put the uh, quotes uh, in three different columns, uh, open or undecided. Um, in the middle is um, opposed or leaning towards no, and on the right is declined to answer or deflected. And you know they also have little photos of, of each of the people. Um, if you, you know, it often happens that we don't have um, individual photos of, of all the people that we get quotes from that um, in qualitative uh, research, um, that's just beyond our capacity. Um, but so you could use um, icons either for um, people or uh, representing the topic that they're talking about. That's another way to do it. But I really like that they put, they organize the data in, um, in this in, into columns. So it's really easy to capture them. Um, you know, see that pattern really quickly. Uh, next slide. This is an example that I made up. Um, so, uh, but just as an example of, you know, putting a, someone's photo and, the, and a quote next to it um, with a little bit of bolded text um, to help bring out the main points that I wanted to highlight. Um, yeah, you might not want, to, this is a, a just a photo that I found online. I'm not recommending that you pull a random photo of someone uh, to put in your report that might not be the best way to, to, to do it. But um, just as an example of putting a photo with text and bolding. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, a case study from a, a really nice report, um, actually from Hawaii. Um, I really enjoyed this. And I, um, it's a case study. It helps break up a lot of text, also puts in that richness of a, a specific example. It has uh, photos, highlighted quotes, very font size so that you um, are able to grab somebody's, the reader's attention really quickly. Um, uh, next slide, please. And then here's an example of um, um, putting the quantitative data with some quotes. Um, so a bar graph on the with the different colors on the left, and then some uh, quotes uh, as examples of each of those categories on the right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then also quantifying your qualitative data. Um, the the uh, one on the with the light blue is from a UN report. It's not actually qualitative data. It's uh, 
it's really quantitative, but the one with the green, with the leaf, that would be an example of um, uh, quantifying qualitative data. So, uh, and, and that little icon is one I think that I got from that noun project. Um, and the, it's called a donut chart that I made in Excel. Um, so representing 45%. Um, so that's pretty easy to make um, in Excel and PowerPoint. Um, next slide, please. Um, heat maps. <clears throat> so this is a cool way of summarizing qualitative data. Um, for more richness, you could add quotes. Um, and on the blog, which um, the reference is at the bottom, you could add um, quotes to it. So if we were hovering, I did not have time to do this, but if you hovered over the each of the colors or each of the squares, you could add quotes that would pop up in your PowerPoint or on your web page. Um, you could also, if you were writing a report, you could just you know put the examples of different quotes for the different categories um, on the side. Uh, next slide, please. Um, word clouds. Um, I really enjoyed this example. I usually just see word clouds on their own, like just one word cloud, but I thought this was an interesting example of um, before and after this one, you know, the different words that people use on uh, Twitter um, uh, before and after a breakup. Um, so you could you could use this um, uh, like before and after a, a development activity or um, um, in villages with or without an intervention. So just to compare the different words that people use. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then a list of uh, free tools. So um, these are the ones that I um, referenced throughout. Um, and I also did not put on there uh, the Evergreen Data Visualization Academy that um, that was something that I got to participate in. That's like a um, monthly. Um, anyway, there are lots of things you'll, you can find out more about that on, on Stephanie's, Stephanie Evergreen's blog um, and the Noun Project, which I referenced, and the other paid tools. So, um, so next slide, I think that is leads us up to question and answers. Great. Thank you, Carrie, for sharing about those really cool methods of qualitative data viz. Um, so this kind of demonstrates that you don't really have to be like a tech wizard or have costly software to do a lot of this sort of data visualization. Um, so let's open it up. Does anybody have questions for Carrie? And just also a reminder, we will send out those slides for these presentations after the event. All these materials will be sent out to everybody so that, you know, you can get those links that she had posted and you can follow up. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. So, um, Carrie, can you talk a little bit about um, any issues about quantifying qualitative data? Hmm. Like, is there anything that we would need to take into consideration, given that our uh, qual qualitative samples are not really representative of a population? Um, yeah, that's that's a great, great question. Thanks. Yeah, sometimes we talk to a, a small group of people, um, so it's hard to um, uh, apply the findings in a, uh, sometimes you have a really specific situation that happened in, in one area of one group of people. Um, so you, you can't really expand that experience to, um, to everyone um, over a broader, broader area. Um, mm. Okay, I see, I see we also have a question maybe from Alpha, it looks like his hand is raised. Alpha, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a, a, a question for Kerry. I wanted to ask to say to what extent um, does the visualization that we want to use determine the type of questions that you're going to administer? Because um, sometimes I think, I feel there's a link between the two 
to what extent do, do the two um, influence each other? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Alpha. You know what? Sometimes I have, um, a, a, I think I know which um, data visualization I want to use, um, and then I, I, I make something, and then I realize it's just not conveying the right message. Uh, it doesn't really clearly tell the story that I want. So it's better to start with what is the story that I want to tell? What's the main point of this um, this this data finding, um, and how do I most clearly tell that? Um, uh, so, I mean, I guess I would really think like, what is what is the main main takeaway? And so, not starting with the the data viz. Um, that that would be my suggestion. Yeah, thank you. The other issue I, and maybe you want to uh, say something about this, Carrie, it's up to you, but um, the other issue I just want to bring to people's attention is um, issues about copyright. So we always need to remember to respect copyright laws and um, licenses. So to be, so especially when you're um, putting data visualizations for deliverable, deliverables that will be published. Um, so we wanna make sure like if we're including maps or icons or other images that you're always um, giving appropriate credit for those sources when you put those into your publications or into your um, documents. Make sure you're um, crediting those sources and that you're pulling from um, sources that are, um, you know, open sources that you're allowed to use those images. Did you have anything about that, Carrie? Um, yeah, I'm always very careful about um, using things that are either open source or giving credit. Um, and actually, to, just to mention, you, you might also need to consider like what, what level of um, quality you need in your to, to be able to print if you're making something really huge, or if you just want high quality printing, you know, maybe the um, pulling pulling icons from free source is not going to be high enough quality, you might need to make them some other way or with the graphic designer or an Adobe Pro or something like that. Um, was there anything else to that question, Robin? No, that was it. Okay. Um, I will have one more question from Frank real quick, and then uh, we're going to have to move on. You know, we're short on time. So uh, once you link the qualitative data to a quantitative data point, do you have any rules of thumb in selecting different visualization techniques? Are there any cheat codes to know as we try to do this work? Mm, great. You know, that that qualitative chart chooser that I showed at the beginning of the presentation is, is a good one to help you. Um, uh, if you if you know the story that you want to tell, um, um, I, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but she says, you know, if you're comparing two things or if you want to tell like change over time, you can, so it gives you kind of some guidelines of uh, some categories of, of things to cons of what your what story you want to tell, and then and then it gives you kind of options of which um, visualizations would be the best. So that is actually a really good um, tool for for picking the, the best visualization. And and then you would maybe think about like, well, how much space do I have? Um, what do I have the time and skill to make? Um, most of the things that are um, described on um, Stephanie Evergreen's blog are with Excel or PowerPoint. So those are um, pretty accessible tools. Um, but again, in, in terms of print quality, you might need to consider that. Um, uh, if you, yeah, Like I said, maybe using Adobe Pro, I, I have, personally have never done that, but um, Excel and PowerPoint have worked for me, um, Microsoft um, Office. Um, yeah, and I think I think we need to move on. Is that right? Robin? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much, Carrie. Yes, um, yeah, those are all great considerations. And if there are other questions, people may ask you in the breakout rooms. Um, so our next presenter is Matheson Sharp. He, um, he's from Save the Children who will give us a brief introduction to 508 compliance um, as we're you know, talking about making data visualizations and things like that for um, publications. Uh, we need to consider 508 compliance. So Matheson is a lead associate on knowledge management and communications with IDEAL, and he is based in Washington, DC. 
a Matheson supports ideal with 508 compliance document um, compliance and remediation, as well as supporting digital communications initiatives and website management. And he's actually our tech lead for today's event. So Matheson, over to you. Thank you so much, Robin, and to my um, co-presenters earlier. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, so today I am going to talk about 508 compliance. Um, you know, as part of the knowledge management and communications team, uh, we really spend our days identifying knowledge gaps, um, sharing knowledge, and, and really even creating knowledge that we can then share. Um, but so much of sharing knowledge depends on an exchange of information and inaccessible information leaves behind members of our community. So we already know how important equity and inclusion are, and we need to center these principles, uh, not just in our content, um, but also in the form of that content, which brings us really nicely to 508 compliance. Um, so a little bit background, 508 compliance is how we refer to the process of making our products accessible. Uh, the term 508 comes from Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which states that programs and activities funded by the US federal government uh, must be accessible. Um, and in that, Section 508 focuses on making digital products accessible. Uh, so what does that mean for us? Uh, loosely, it means that reports, briefs, PowerPoint presentations like this one, online learning modules, social media, all products uh, must be accessible for everyone. Um, by doing this, we need to ensure that screen reading technology can make sense of our documents, um, that people or users with low vision can see information in color, and people with mo limited mobility can navigate our online uh, resources. So with that said, um, there are several easy steps that we can all take uh, to really make this process more efficient when it comes to finally uh, publishing your, uh, your, your products. Um, so the first place I'd like to start is with alt, te alt text. Um, we all love photos, charts, graphics, and visualizations. Um, obviously, they communicate so much, uh, which is why there's the old adage, a photo is worth a, a thousand words. Um, but of course, not everyone can see images that we add, unfortunately. Um, and in these cases, uh, individuals use screen reading technology, uh, which reads aloud or translates to Braille all document text um, and descriptions of any uh, images or graphics um, on a page. Um, those image descriptions are called alternate text or the shorthand alt text. Um, so I want to show you a painting. Look at this beautiful painting, right? There are so many different ways to describe it. Here are a couple examples of auto-generated um, alt text. Um, now imagine that this is all the information that you receive from this image. Um, you know, it, it, it's really as about as useful as if there wasn't any information at all. So you really need to think about how can I describe what is being conveyed in this image to someone who can't see it? Really think through the important elements, the, the, the graphic um, you know, descriptors that you spent a lot of time creating. How can I convey that through words? Um, so just as we don't need a thousand words, we can describe it succinctly. Um, and that's not just true for photos, as I mentioned, graphs, charts, infographics, even tables, we need to uh, consider alt text. Um, adding alt text is really quite simple. Um, you can add alt text to an image in Word by, and really most of the Microsoft Office suite, by uh, right clicking on an image, clicking format, uh, and then clicking the layout and properties icon, and then typing your description. Um, that's that's really all there is to it. Um, very easy and customizable. Uh, the next aspect I want to consider is color. Um, so I know that so many organizations put a lot of thought and practice into identifying brand colors um, that are beautiful and appealing. Um, but colors should never be the only way to transmit information. So I wanted to show you this example. Um, I have two tables side by side. 
Um, and most of us would look at this and assume, yeah, green means it's a go, it's complete. Yellow, we're in some kind of a holding pattern. Um, and then red is incomplete or a non-starter. Um, but not everybody experiences color in, in the same way. Um, so anytime that we use color as a designator, we also have to accompany it with text. Um, so as you can see from this second um, table, there's a text that is associated with each color. Um, this is so that when a screen reader is going through these tables, um, whether they're going up or down, right to left, they, the audience would understand the information uh, conveyed uh, therein, whether they can see color or not. Um, there are several uh, free, free and paid tools that you can use to test for color contrast, um, which I'll get into in my next slide. Um, but one of them is WebAIM, which is a free online uh, tool where you can test the foreground color and the background color um, to see if there's enough contrast to meet those um, requirements. So speaking of color contrast, color contrast is exactly as it sounds. You want there to be enough differentiation between the front color and the color that it, uh, that text is imposed over um, so that people can see it. Um, this example on screen is um, a color contrast that does not meet 508 standards. Uh, the white on a light background just becomes very difficult to see. Um, this is a 508 compliant color contrast. Immediately, you can see the difference. The white just pops so much more against a dark, darker um, background. Um, and really, it, it just makes it easier for people to see, which is, which is our end, end goal. Um, so thinking about color contrast at the beginning helps you avoid having to recreate charts and go back um, and edit graphics later. Um, so ne next, let's talk about tables. Tables also um, require 508 um, consideration from both a color contrast standpoint uh, and also alternate text. So if you have a document that has a table, um, you have to be thinking about 508 too. Uh, there are some quick steps that we can take um, to, to really make sure that all our documents um, are, are compliant for, uh, for tables as well. And the first place to start with that is a caption. Um, captions really are just a header or a heading for the table um, that helps users understand the bigger picture and how this table relates to the context of the page. Um, they generally auto-populate above a table, um, which allows screen readers to announce the captioning uh, before moving on to the content, which allows the reader to decide if they want to explore further. Uh, you can add a caption by simply right-clicking on the table and choosing Insert Caption. And as I mentioned, just like images, alt text uh, is needed for tables too. Um, so this dives a little bit deeper than the caption and um, explains the information that is contained in the table um, and should be descriptive to allow an understanding of the content without the user having to go line by line. Um, you can add alt text by right-clicking on the table, selecting table properties and navigating to the alt text tab. Um, one more consideration um, in terms of formatting with tables is um, selecting repeating header rows. Uh, including repeating header rows is really important as it allows page readers to identify content immediately as part of a table um, and then especially give context if it has extended beyond a page. Um, you know, we may create um, a really stylized document but if a screen reader or a user um, really increase, increases the zoom on a page or the size of the text, it can push it beyond um, that one page you had initially had it on. So it's always good to have those repeating header rows to give context throughout. Um, the goal here is really to ensure that content does not just appear without proper identification and context, which can be confusing. Um, you can enable this feature uh, by simply highlighting the header row and then clicking repeat header row in the layout tab. Um, so we learned a little bit about con color contrast earlier, um, but it's also applicable to tables. 
So tables with color coding or formatting must all also adhere to these color contrast standards. So making sure that colors using alternate rows, headers, or fonts um, provide enough contrast with their background uh, will allow low vision readers, users um, to read and understand content. Um, so that is a, a very quick fire um, overview of 508 compliance. I know that for a lot of people, especially those outside of the US, um, accessibility is not new, but the specifics of 508 compliance um, are just uh, something that we're all learning. Um, so happy to take any questions that, that may have, have come up. Um, and I yes, see I see there's... there's one question from Meredith. What is the threshold of color contrast? And will the free website you just showed let us know if we haven't met this criteria? Great questions. Um, so yes, both. Um, I'm going to kind of do those in reverse reverse order. Um, the website web aim that I showed um, will automatically tell you whether you are um, compliant or or not. Um, let me pull up that. So the contrast ratio um, will tell you whether whether it has met that. It's generally a seven to one ratio that we look look for. Um, but by grabbing these two colors it will automatically tell you um, at the bottom screen where you see normal text and large text, it will automatically run those tests for you. So you know if you're using those two color combinations that you're compliant once it tell, gives you a handy little green pass icon. Um, so yes, and I will, um, once I'm done uh, with this presentation, I'll, I'll drop a link to WebAIM. Um, there are lots of similar test um, programs that you can find online. Um, if you have the Adobe Suite, Adobe Color does it really nicely as well. Um, but 508 really just meets those um, WCAG, AA and AAA um, standards, uh, which, which are not specific to 508. That's really a more broad accessibility uh, standard. All right, thank you, Matheson. Um, does anybody else have a question that they want to ask? Great. All right. Well, um, OK, so it looks like we don't have any more questions at the moment. So now uh, we're going to. Oh, maybe the question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, maybe let me just vocalize it. I wanted to ask um, Matheson if, uh, if you put the alternative text in Word or mm -hmm. PowerPoint on your pictures and stuff, is it preserved when you later convert that document to Word? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a great question and, and very important. To, to PDF, I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, no, understood. That's that's perfect. Um, I would say nine times out of ten, your alt text will be preserved um, when it is exported to a PDF. The only times that it, you may have to just go back and double check those um, is if when when an element is converted to a PDF if it thinks that it's something other than an image or a figure. So sometimes um, the PDF converter will automatically see a table or see a graphic element that has text on top of it and think, oh, this is a paragraph. And so then it will miss, miss that alt text that was included because it's, it's tagged as something other than an image or a figure. Um, so it's always good practice after you've exported a PDF to go through and um, just run a check for the accessibility. Um, and then if you notice that any of those um, alt text that you created was not carried over, you can then re-add those um, using the accessibility checker within uh, Adobe PDF. Uh, Preview, I believe, also does that if you're using Mac products. Um, but yeah, so the short answer is most of the time, always worth a double check to make sure everything went, went as planned. Great, thank you so much, Matheson. Okay, now we are going to take about 20 minutes and we're gonna go into small breakout groups. Um, so we welcome you all to share your own examples and experiences in the breakout rooms. Uh, we wanna hear from everybody. Um, and then we're gonna report out after our discussion. So you all will be randomly assigned to a breakout room and a message will pop up and letting you know which group you're going to be in. Um, and you'll need to click on join the group in order to get into the room. 
Um, so in your groups, we are going to break out into three groups and we have three different questions. Um, in room one, we have a question on mixed methods. And the question is, what steps can researchers take to improve the ability for mixed method data to be analyzed and synthesized effectively? In group two, we have a question on data visualization. So what challenges have you experienced trying to present qualitative data? And then uh, in room three, we have a que another question on mixed methods. What challenges have you had with mixed, method mixed methods research? So that could be that it's just more complex, it requires more expertise, or it's more expensive, um, things like that. So those are the three questions um, for each of those three breakout rooms. And OK, I guess we will see you here in about 20 minutes. Thank you. All right, so I'll give it just a second for everybody to get back in the room. All right, so uh, yeah, let's hear from the, the, the groups, the different groups uh, on what you all discussed. Um, so let's see if I can ask the facilitators um, Karen and Micah, if you could let us know what happened in group one. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Robin. We had a really interesting discussion. Uh, so I appreciate all the input and conversation. Um, I think a few key themes that emerged from the conversation um, are number one, um, that it's really important to start with a clear purpose and a design. Um, when we're trying to use mixed methods approaches um, because we've got some information that's better collected quantitatively, some quantitatively, um, and then within that design to maintain some flexibility um, so that we can uh, adequately draw on those, those tools depending upon the question and the purpose. Again, a lot of our conversation focused on that. Like what's the purpose? What are the questions we're trying to, to answer? And those were topics and themes raised by our presenters today as well. Start with the questions and then what story are we trying to tell? How can we best use not just um, the data viz tools, but also um, the different methods? Um, another key theme was about the amount of time that we need um, for analysis in general, whether it be qual or quant, but in particular to think forward about the time that it takes to really iterate and triangulate across our mixed methods approaches, our qual and quant data, and to allocate time to, to do that throughout the process from start to finish. A third main theme that emerged from our conversation has to do with sequential data analysis or sequential data collection and, and in, in encouraging that we've got some kind of iterative or sequential process um, within our mixed methods approach. Recognizing also that often we are constrained by time and resources. And so that sequential component may be difficult to allocate resources for, but if we can, that's a really important way to, to do it. And the, the way that we do that is gonna depend on the research question itself. So it could be qual first that triggers quant questions. It could be the other way around. Um, so I think those were the key themes that came out. Um, Ruth, anything to add to or, or comment on or correct? Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That is, those are all extremely important points. Thank you, Karen. All right, let's move on to Carrie, and I believe it was Emily who's going to report out for us on group two on DataBiz. Sure, thanks. I'll try and keep it short, but our group talked about um, that one of the main challenges is that qualitative data can be very text heavy. Um, we don't want to lose any of the richness of qualitative data, but we also don't want to make a report so long that no one's going to read it. Um, another challenge related to quotes and photos was making sure we protect people's privacy at the same time. 
um, and just finding um, publicly available free to use photos and images as well. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so what about group three? I believe that's Frank and Monica. How'd that go? Yeah, um, well, in, in regard to the question about what surprised us, I mean, the most surprising thing that was raised in the meeting was um, the available tools to represent qualitative data uh, was surprising to a number of people in our group. And I think that was really kind of an empowering um, uh, presentation uh, because people just didn't realize all the tools and it, it helped them think about how to, how to link these data together in much more concrete ways. Um, in terms of the specific question that we were asked about the challenges with mixed methods research, uh, just kind of echoing what uh, Karen's already mentioned, it's the time and having the time available to craft qualitative questions in response to some of the findings from the quantitative data side so that you can actually follow up and understand uh, what's going on with that quantitative data in more detail. Um, in terms of the uh, writing that people um, put in the tables, uh, there's really the kind of uh, problem with different interpretations between the quantitative and qualitative results, which can happen. Um, and how do you reconcile those two? Um, and then also, um, the availability of uh, trained researchers who can actually collect this qualitative data in sufficient detail is a real challenge that people have um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, I don't know if anybody else from the group had anything to say uh, to echo or, uh, I mean, we raised a lot of issues, but those were the ones that to me seem to be the most kind of common. Monica, you're welcome to chime in as well. Okay. Yeah, uh, just, oh, someone else, go ahead. No, that's all right. Go ahead, Monica. Um, another, a couple other salient points that came out of our, um, our discussion were regarding um, contradictory information, you know, when, when with the quantitative and the qualitative uh, do not sync up, <laughs> you know, what do you do with that? Um, so that can be a challenge. Um, and <laughs> Uh, a point that really resonated with me, um, someone had noted, was um, people tend to trust uh, quantitative data and, and numbers more than qualitative. I've, I've heard that a lot from from clients. Is that you know they want they want the numbers, <laughs> um, and that's just seen as more rigorous somehow. So there's kind of a a cultural um, barrier there <laughs> in, in in this you know M and &E world to to appreciate that those differences. Um, and just following up on the um, just tools theme, um, someone pointed out the lack of open source software for, for content analysis. I know some of these packages um, can be quite expensive. Um, and I would add also that um, there's a whole learning curve that um, you know, your staff have to, have to go through. And so you need to figure out how to make that investment um, efficient and, and worthwhile. There's some more really good points in the notes, but those are some that I thought were, um, you know, kind of kind of unique to highlight. Yeah, those are all really really great points. Uh, yeah, particularly like what you were saying about, um, you know, there's tons of quantitative software, open source quantitative software out there, but not necessarily so much on the qualitative software side. So yeah, those are all good points. Um, I see that we are over time. So um, unfortunately, it's time to wrap up. Thanks everyone for a great conversation. And all uh, we really wanna thank all of the presenters today, Micah and Carrie and Matheson. Thank you for your great presentations. Uh, we really appreciate you all taking your time to just share your knowledge with our community. Um, it's great to have these sort of exchanges of good practice. And also thanks to Karen and Micah, Frank, Carrie, and all the facilitators in the breakout room discussions. Uh, also thanks to Matheson and Bella for being our tech leads for today's event. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up today's session. Um, just as a final request, I believe uh, Bella has put a link into the chat to, that you all can follow that link to answer a very short evaluation about today's event. This kind of helps us enhance future events and make future events better. 
Um, and also, if you think you might be interested in getting involved with the Qualmi peer community, there's an opportunity to indicate that, uh, that interest in that evaluation form. Um, I'm going to quickly hand it over to Frank. I know you had a quick, um, you wanted to sort of uh, take a moment to ask for uh, help with recruiting local implementing partners. So Frank, I'll hand it over to you and then um, I'll say uh, some closing words. Yeah, I just, uh, thank you, Robin. We at the Ideal Activity are really sensitive to the fact that um, we need to include more um, perspectives in our work and in, in defining our work and uh, people who are participating in activities um, like Qualmi. Um, and I'm going to be sending out uh, soon a, um, a request to get your um, uh, input into local partners that you've been working with uh, that you might think would benefit, that you think would benefit from Qualmi or any of the other ideal activities um, that we uh, uh, sponsor. And so I just wanted to highlight that fact and say uh, to look for an email from me uh, very soon on that. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, everybody. Great, thank you so much. Yes, I see also that Karen put a link into the chat on um, the previous recordings for earlier Qualmi events. So you all can uh, follow that link if you'd like to see some of the other events that we've had this year. Um, so, and, you know, thank you, Frank, for your, um, for your email that you're gonna send out to everybody. Um, I'm just gonna let everyone know that we will send out a follow-up email from today's event with, uh, additional materials from um, all the presenters here today. There's also going to be the recording of today's session if you want to rewatch it. Um, and also please be on the lookout in the FSN newsletter for any upcoming events that we have in this series. And thanks again. Have a nice day and bye. Uh, shukran masalama. <laughs>